God, one of the things that God does, he opens you the eyes of your understanding. This is what's called illumination. And some of you all can really attest to that, that when you became a child of God, the day that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you heard old saints talk about it, you heard it in songs and things like that, it sound, they said, you know, for the first time, they were saying, my, my hands look new, my feet did too. Paul, in, 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 the, in the book of Acts, after Ananias came and prayed for him because he was blinded, the Bible says it was like great scales fell from his eyes. And he was able to see, not just, he wasn't able just to see naturally, but for the first time, he was able to see the Lord for who he was. He knew the Lord, or he knew God, the God of Yahweh. He knew the God of the Torah. He knew the God of the books of the Bible from, from Genesis all the way over to Deuteronomy. He knew this God in practice, in theory of Judaism and all the rituals, but he didn't have relationship with him the same way we didn't before we came to Christ. We heard a lot about God. We heard our mamas, our daddies, and other people talk about God and talk about the grace of God and prayer and all this kind of stuff, but we didn't know him for ourselves in sin, but the day that we accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, the day that we received that grace of in our lives when we believed that he died, was buried, and rose again for our sins, is the day our eyes were open. And for the first time, even before you got saved, when the Holy Spirit was dealing with you, you began to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit that you were a sinner and you needed to be saved. How many of y'all remember that right there? If you remember, you begin to feel, you, you begin to feel the conviction that, God, I'm wrong and that the things I'm doing is wrong. And, Lord, I know I'm, I'm sinning against you and I'm on my way to a devil's hell if you don't change my life or save me. And that's the day you said yes to Jesus. Now, with that being said, when you received him, the eyes of your understanding, the Bible says, were enlightened. For you to now be able to know and to see things that you couldn't see before. Your spiritual eyes opened up because you got, as the Bible says in John, the book of John 3 and verse 16, you got born again. You were born again. For God's little word that gave the only begotten son who has believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That is now, you, you got that everlasting life, you've been born again. And so your eyes were open because for the first time you are now seeing spiritually what you used to be, again, blind to. And in your seeing, seeing that you are lost, seeing the spiritual realm, seeing Jesus Christ for who he is, starting to see truth from the word of God. I know you all can attest. I'm not the only one because it happens with all believers. For the first time, you started having a desire to come to church. For the first time, the word of God started making sense to you. At one point in time, you used to hear it, and I told you before, it sounded like Japanese or Chinese, ping pong, ping. It sounded like that to you. But when you got born again, it started to, for the first time, the preacher makes sense. I understand what he's saying. Before then, all I heard was, <laughs> that's all I heard. But now, I said, oh, between those, <laughs> I understand what he's saying. And I was like, wow, this makes sense. I see what he is saying, write this down, because with the eyes of faith, you don't hear with your ears, nor do you see with your eyes. You hear and you see with your heart. See, your understanding is enlightened. You still see with your physical eyes, you still hear with your physical ears the things that are physical. But in the, but in the spirit, God begins to talk to you. And he don't talk to you in your ear, he talks to you in the inner man that's been born again, that's, that's, that's awakened. And you start hearing for the first time the voice of God. You start seeing for the first time the truth and the mysteries that once were hidden. And a part of those eyes that God gives you to see, you don't only recognize him but you start recognizing the one that used to have you in bondage. You start seeing schemes of the enemy. You start seeing some of the bondages and some of the, the problems and the issues that used to plague you, but now you're free from and you're trying to walk in a new way. And God begins to let you see, this is what used to hold you captive. 
This is what used to have you in bondage. These are the things that you used to be blind to, but now for the first time, you start seeing. And so this is a part of what we're talking about when we say breaking family iniquities. Because every one of us, every one of us who are alive today, every one of us who are here came from a family. You didn't just show up. The stork didn't drop you off. Don't stop watching them type of cartoons and listen to that kind of rhetoric and on, uh, on whatever programs you are. You didn't drop, get dropped off by no stork. Don't let your children watch stuff like that. You make sure your children know you was born from a man and a woman, me and your mama. Oh, if you're a man, you know what I'm saying. You came through by way of birth. Don't let them watch stuff dealing with evolution. You didn't, you didn't evolve from no amoeba to a frog, I mean to a tadpole, then a frog who lost his tail, then popped up on the ground and walked, became a, uh, became a, a, a monkey, and a monkey uh, had lost his tail, then you stood up right and became a man. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You know, it takes more faith to believe that than to believe God created man in his image and his likeness. Because if we was evolving like that, why are we not still evolving? Why are we not still amoebas and tadpoles and frogs and, and, and losing tails and monkeys hanging from trees, dropping their tail off and now becoming mean and walking upright? It's, it's not so. So I'm just saying be mindful of what you allow to come into your ear gates. Because in these things and in, in what I'm saying, you start seeing for the first time. You start seeing truth. And as you see these truths and you see these things in the families that you were born in, now, in your family, there are, in most cases, a mother and a father. Sometimes we're born in single-parent families, okay? But when you pay attention to your family line, if you will pay attention to your family line and the people in your family, whether you're the only child and you check out your mom or dad or, they, or th their parents and all that, you can begin to see certain patterns of behavior. Because most of our behaviors come from either nature or nurture. That's a psychological term, just nature or nurture. That means we, it, it was passed down through the DNA of the mom and dad, them 23 chromosomes that was passed down through the bloodline from both of your parents, and it makes up your DNA, your profile as a person, and all your, your, your way you look, your personality, all these things came from your mom and dad. That's nature. But nurture is your environment, what you, what you lived in, what you was brought up around, who you associated with, things you were taught, your diet, your education. All of these things are part of nurture. So most behaviors come from that. But all of these things are not only physical, but they're also spiritual. Now, if you will pay attention, if you look at these things and track and watch what's been going on, you will see certain patterns of behavior in your family. We talked about some of these things last week. You will see that in, I'm talking about sinful behaviors, not, not righteous, but sinful, because most of us grew up in families where we didn't have righteous parents or righteous grandparents or righteous men and women who stood upon the word of God and taught us and handed these things down. I'm talking about myself, and I'm talking about myself, and I'm also talking to you because some of you can relate. My family line, my dad and mom, again, were good people, but they were not born again as we were growing up. They had a level of religion, a level of religious activities that my mom would go to church and bring us to church. You know, she that definitely made me go. She made me go with her to church. I don't remember too many other besides Carolyn and Rodney, but the rest of them, I don't remember them going too much. I don't remember Angela going to church. I don't remember Jeffrey and Donnell and Tommy and these my brothers. I don't remember them, you know, Nisa sometimes. But as they got older, they kind of faded out. But there was religious activity. But in our home life, personally, man, there was alcoholism. There was drug addiction. There was arguing and fighting and family dysfunction. And there was, you know, premarital sex. And there was violence. And there was stealing and, and head cracking and fighting and all kind of stuff that went on, slipping and dipping and midnight tipping, and there was prison and all kind of stuff, bondage. And I watched these things. I saw these things not only before I became a Christian, but afterwards. I began to look back. And I said, I'm saying, I'm seeing some things. I'm seeing that all of my brothers 
are alcoholics. All of them struggle with addiction. And I said, not me. Mm -mm. I don't see what that do to them. I don't see what that, what that is. I don't see my dad die from drinking and, and uh, cirrhosis of the liver, emphysema, all that. I've seen this. I said, so I ain't going to do that. That was me. I said, I ain't going to do that. But by the time I was 13, I was already getting high. By the time I was 13, well, really before that, Carl, I'm going to tell you, we would go into the liquor cabinet, find the little leftover pints of liquor that my daddy used to drink. Then he had like a little half a gallon jug of what they used to have, and we would, we would just pour it in there, taking a little leftover and pouring it in there, mixing it up. Until we had about that much in that half a gallon jug, and we sneak out in the woods and take turns. <laughs> and then go get some green apples and eat them and throw up. See, if we were doing this as children because it was in the, it was in the environment. In the environment. As, a, as I told you before, as a young child, as a young child, and I'm being transparent, I'm already at the age of seven and eight sneaking in my brother's room. And in their room, they got pictures of women on the wall that don't have clothes on. And I mean they're like this. <laughs> See, because that's in my environment. That's in my environment. By the time I'm seven and eight, I'm, I'm already looking at Playboy magazines, Hustler magazines. I'm looking at magazines of what they call soft pornography. By the time I'm in middle school, I'm watching, I'm watching pornography every day after school with the big VHS tapes. So in middle school, middle school is when I started having sex. Middle school is when I started. Because it was, not only, it was not only in the DNA of my daddy to be a rolling stone, but it was also passed down to all of us in the family line. Not only with the alcohol, not only with the drugs, not only with the crime mindset, not only with, the, with all these other things, but also some of the other proclivities. So when I said certain things I wasn't going to do, certain things I wasn't going to be, certain things I wasn't going to, again, allow, because my daddy, I saw what it did to my dad, I saw what it did to my brothers, without even being conscious of it, I was already doing it. I was already drinking. I was already getting high. Teenager. I was already breaking the law, stealing, breaking in cars, breaking in houses, taking things that didn't belong to me. I was already doing this as a teenager until I got caught at the age of 15 and was looking at 12 years of prison. You see? See, and I said, I said, I'm the smart one. I'm the one with the benefit of seeing what all the mistakes they made. How did I get caught up in this right here? Tell somebody it's called a family iniquity. It's a call to family. In other words, what the word iniquity means, we said on last week, iniquity means it's a bend. See, the way of the Lord is straight and narrow. The Bible says straight is the way that leads to life. Narrow is the gate that leads to the way of salvation. But wide is the way that leads to destruction. So whenever it, when you're dealing with God, you're dealing with that which is straight, that which is clear, that which is clearly right or clearly wrong. It ain't no gray areas in God. God lets you know clearly, this is what I expect, this is what I want, and this is how I expect you to live. Gray areas are what the world begins to blend in and make wide and says, well, you know, you can do this and maybe you can do that. And the, and, and the way of what is right and wrong gets blurred and you begin to mix. See, the way of God is straight. So perversion or iniquity simply means that there is a being, there's a twist. There is, in other words, instead of being straight, there's a curve or, or, or it winds. Like I just found out, and I'm going to get to this in just a minute. At my house, there's a tree about to fall on my building. 
I had the three guys that come out there last week, and they told me a price, and I said, good, come and cut it down. They get out there, they get out there, and, they, and I'm, I'm somewhere else. They call me and they say, Mr. Stone, we can't cut this tree down. I'm saying, what? Why not? They said, you have, there is, uh, I forgot the name of it. They said, but there is, a, there, is a, there's a, uh, there is a vine that has grown all around that tree. It's twisted all around that tree. And then it has ran across to the other, another tree. That's the only reason why the tree hasn't fallen. I know that. I said, I saw the vine. I said, thank God for that vine. Because that vine wasn't wrapped around that tree, and it had already fallen. The vine is the only thing holding it up. And I was like, so what? I was like, cut the vine. Cut the tree. Cut all that stuff off and then cut the vine and everything. I want all of it gone. They said, no, it's poisonous. I said, what? They said, yeah, it's poisonous. And they said, and we don't know when we cut this tree. That yo, this tree could twist because of the vine. And they said it could fall on the power line. It could fall on a truck. It could fall on one of the men. Or it could fall on your building. And they said we just don't want to take this type of liability. So they said if somebody will come. He said he, they told me this on the phone. Because they was going to cut it down for $600. I was like cut it down. And they was like. And he was like. He said if somebody comes and tells you they'll cut it down for $1,200. He said you better get them to cut it down. He said because they'll be doing you a favor if they cut it down for $1,200. I said what? I'm thinking to myself, what? He said, well, what you might want to do is call Duke Power. He said, because it's real close to your power line. He said, and maybe Duke Power will come and cut away this twisted vine that's around this tree. In other words, he was letting me know, the vine that has grown over the years has entangled itself with the nature of that tree. That's what iniquity does. Iniquity literally gets in your ideology, your mindset. It gets into your emotion. It gets into your psyche. And it literally twists that which is straight. That which is normal, it makes it abnormal. It makes that which is right unrighteous because it bends and it wraps itself around your emotions, your thinking, your, your feelings, your reasoning, so that it's twisted. So what is abnormal to normal people is normal to you. For some people, your family iniquity is lying. Lying is just common to you. I had a cousin that lied for no reason. For no good reason. Some of y'all got family members and friends just like that. They lie when they're not even in trouble. They lie because it's just as easy for them to lie as it is for them to tell the truth. And they just lie for no reason. I had a cousin like that, and I'd be sitting listening to him tall, tell these tall tales, and I'm sitting there looking at him saying, when did you get a motorcycle? I was just with you yesterday. You had broke his wife. You poor as me. You ain't got, man, I got this Yamaha, I got this, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there saying, what? And I'm looking saying, what? And I'm saying, and I put him to the side, I said, what are you lying for? You don't have a reason to lie. You're not even in trouble. Nobody's questioning you. Nobody's trying to even hem you up. I only lie when I'm in trouble. That's what I told him. I'm only, I only lie when I'm trying to get out of something. That's when I lie. When I don't want to take responsibility for my action, I, I ain't do that. So I said, but you lie for no reason. I said, why is that? You know what he said? I don't know. And I was like, wow. So you know people like this. You know people who, again, well, alcohol, drinking and alcohol, it's just something that they do. It's, 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 it's in the family. Everybody drinks. Everybody gets drunk. You know people, again, let me, get a little, let me get closer to your family, where anger is an issue like it was in mine. Where most of the people are, are angry and they are, again, those that has a little torch or a little, what I, say, or what I call a pallet light that's always burning. A little pallet light burning under the surface. And the only thing they need is a little bit of gas for it to flame up, and you got a problem now. You got a God, they're getting ready. I'm talking about they're getting ready to fight. They, in other words, they cussing, they fussing, they fighting. There's, there, there's arguments, there's strife all the time. You want to know why? Because anger is their iniquity. 
unforgiveness and bitterness is their uh, iniquity. They, some people find it hard to let something go. They will go to the grave with an offense or something that you've been wrong because that's their family iniquity. Sometimes it's pride. Some people don't. In other words, your family iniquity is that you got so much pride, you can be going through a problem and need so much help, but you won't, you won't ask for help at all. You won't let anybody know you're, something's wrong, you're hurting, you need help. You'd rather suffer and go through without or whatever to the point of where you are just destitute before you say, I need some help. Or before you receive help. See, that's also a family iniquity. And then there are family iniquities like perversion. Perversion. And these perversions come in so many different ways. It could be sexual perversions. Where you got men who want to be with men and women who want to be with women. And you have the, the perversion again where you think, you got people who think they are, that when, they're, when their body clearly tells them they're male but they think they're female. Or their body clearly tells them they're female but they want to be a male so they start dressing like, talking like, walking like, behaving like. This is what's known as a perversion. You even have it in some families where incest is a real problem. Incest is the perversion. You know, where family members want to sleep with each other. And then you got some perversions where they have, where, uh, uh, what, what they call them, them uh, pedophiles, where they just got to be with a child. These are perversions. They, they're perversions. Some of you all see the family iniquities where you got sex outside of marriage, where there's woman or woman after woman being pregnant outside of wedlock. Or you got guys having babies outside of marriage, several kids and all this kind of stuff. See, and it's in the family line. These are things that's known as iniquitous pattern. What about lazy? What about being lazy? don't want to work. My wife talked about that in her family. Folk who don't want to work can't keep a job because they don't want to work. Don't want to work. Don't want to work in a pie factory, testing pies. The Bible said the lazy man is so slothful that he won't even, he put his hand in the bowl and he's so lazy he don't want to pick it up, up and feed himself again. That's how lazy. So you see that in your family where you're always in between jobs or in between responsibilities. What about that iniquitous pattern of quitting and giving up? Stopping, 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 starting. I'm going to get to it. I'm going back. You start something, you stop it. You start something, you stop it. You start it, you stop it. I mean, it's always a reason or excuse for not following through, not finishing. That is what is known as an iniquitous pattern. I could go on and on, but y'all getting, you getting what I'm saying? You getting the picture? Because, again, in Exodus 34, 7, I told y'all to go there, didn't I? Well, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Look what it says here, Exodus 34, 7, then we're going to get into some solutions. The Bible says that God keeps mercy for thousands. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. We talked about that last week. God forgives iniquity. That means these, 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 these patterns, these twists, these, these, these things that, that, that bend us out of the way. He also forgives transgression, like when we willfully sin. That's transgression means I willfully sin. And sometimes that is a part of our iniquitous family line. You can know what's right and choose to still do wrong. I know I should be up right now, but I'm going to lay in the bed. I know I'm supposed to be cleaning, but I ain't going to clean. I know I should be studying, I ain't going to study. I know I should be working, but I ain't going to work. You know, and the Bible says to know to do good and don't do it. It is sin. It's sin. It is an iniquitous pattern. Then he says, and then sin in general. He said, but this is the key. He said, and that will by no means clear the guilty. In other words, God says, when there is guilt, there is going to be a consequence. And some of us like to go to churches, and we like to hear preachers preach about the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. You like to hear things like new levels. We like to hear things about how God's going to bless and how God's going to heal, how God's going to deliver, how God's going to set free. We love to hear all that good stuff. But we don't want to hear anything about sin. You don't want to hear anything about transgression. You don't want to hear anything about iniquity. You don't want to hear anything about hell. You don't want to hear anything about bondage. And you don't want to hear those things because uh, that just don't sound too good. But I want you to understand something. As much as God's a God of love, he's a God of judgment. As much as he's a God of mercy, he's a God of wrath. As much as he is a God that is, uh, again, patient and long-suffering, his patience and long-suffering also runs out. And one of the things that you don't want to do, by the grace of God, as God said to the children of Israel, God said, they provoked me to anger, and I spoke to them in my wrath. 
and you know that anything that God speaks, it must come to pass. And what you don't want to do is through a continual action of sin is invoke the anger of God and, and he pronounces a judgment because once it's pronounced, it cannot be revoked. And these are things he's saying here when you read here in Exodus. He said, because I will not clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. Prime example, David was a man after God's own heart. God loved David, anointed him as a young child to be the king over Israel. And he loved David. David was the sweet psalmist of Israel. David outside on the, on the mountainside blowing kisses to the Lord, singing melodies of God, had such a heart for the Lord, and he loved God with all his heart. He really did. But it came a day when God ex exalted David to his level of the king, and he became the king over Israel. He was outside on his balcony when he should have been at the battle with the rest of the kings fighting. And he saw this woman named Bathsheba bathing. And when he saw that woman bathing, his family iniquitous pattern kicked in. He said, get that woman right there. I want her. His servant said, isn't that the wife of Uriah the Hittite? That was his door of escape. With every temptation, there's a door of escape. When his servant told him, isn't that the wife of Uriah the Hittite, your servant? David said, don't care. Get her. Y'all know the story. Just read it. He got her. Lay with her. A few weeks later, she says, I'm pregnant. David says, oh boy, we got a problem. I'm the king. I represent righteousness. I represent truth. I represent the word of God. He said, we got to hide this right here. So David, David said, your husband can't find out about this. It's going to cause a problem. So he said, he called Uriah in and said, go home. Go ahead and spend some time with your wife. Uriah said, man, I can't do that while, while my brothers who are fighting in the battle are sleeping out in tents and who are out there. He said, you think I'm going to go home and sleep with my wife in my warm bed while my other brothers are out here fighting? Uriah said, I can't do that. So David couldn't get him to do that because David wanted him to sleep with his wife so he could act like it was his baby. But Uriah had more righteousness and more honor than that. So David said, can't get him like this. So David sent a message to his men and said, all right, tell you what you got to do. Put Uriah out in the front of the battle. Where the battle is the hottest, where it's the most fierce enemy, put him out in the front and then put him over there where the most fierce enemy is. And when y'all advance, kind of retreat back a little bit. So he'll be the first one who gets struck down. Now, normally, David would have killed anybody for even thinking like that. But see, he's in, now, he's in an iniquitous pattern. And his, another part of the iniquitous pattern was deception and lying. And so it happens. Uriah gets killed. The word comes back. David's all good. He's all happy. And he thinks everything is good. He goes ahead. He gets, he gets Bathsheba. He marries her. And he says, you know, your husband dead. I can marry you now. It'll be covered up. But there was a problem. God saw it. Because God sees everything. The eyes of the Lord in every place beholding the good and evil. So the prophet Nathan shows up and says, David, let me tell you a little story about a man named Jed. No, he said, let me tell you a story. He said, he said, with this guy who came to town, a friend of this rich guy. And this rich guy had a lot of sheep, had a lot of sheep. And this rich guy, his friend came to town and said, you know, let's have some fellowship. So they sat down to have dinner. And he said, and instead of him, taking one of the many thousands of sheep that he had in his own flock, he went to this young, this guy, he didn't say he young, but he said this guy, who only had one little lamb. He loved that lamb like he loved his own son or daughter. He cared for it. He it ate from his table. It slept with him. He loved that little lamb. He said that rich man who had more power, more strength, went and took that man's lamb, took it from him because he was stronger than him, and he killed it and dressed it, and they ate it for his friends. Boy, David got hot. David said, what? David said, who did such a wicked thing as this? He said, the man who did this, he ought to be put to death. Nathan the prophet looked at him and said, David, thou art the man. He said, when you was young and you was overlooked, nobody knew you, nobody cared about you, you was nothing at all. He said, David, he said, David, the Lord picked you up. And he made you something. 
He put his anointing on you. He, he put you in the king's palace. He let you serve the king. Then he took you through all your trials of life, protect you through all these different problems. And he said, and then he set you over. He set you over the whole house of Israel, the entire nation. He said, David, you had thousands of women you could choose from. Thousands of women you could have chose from. He said, why did you take the one wife of that one man and take her and then sleep with her and then kill, have her husband kill? He says, David, you are the man. And what God did, he spoke to David in his wrath. And he said to David, because I love you and because you are my child, he says, I'm putting your sin away. He said, in other words, your, your consequence for this sin ought to be death. You ought to be put to death. He said, because you've made an occasion for the, blat for the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme my name. He said, but the sword will never leave your house. That was what the Lord spoke through the prophet. He said, the sword will never leave your house. In other words, he said to David, because of this one action, because of this iniquitous pattern, because of this behavior that you did not check and that you did not break, that you did not stop. He said, now the sword will never leave your house. In other words, that means he said, you're going to have murder. You're going to have sibling rivalry. You're going to have incest. You're going to have problem after problem after problem for as long as you are living. You will never have peace in your family. And if you look at the life of David, his sons rebelled against him. His daughter was raped by her other bro by her brother, her half brother. His his son Absalom rose up and ran him out of the kingdom, ran him out of the kingdom and tried to kill him. He had problem after problem and theologians say David died with an incurable disease like syphilis. Because God says, the sword will never leave your house. Although I love you, Although you're my son, but you did not break this family iniquity. And for this reason, these actions have now opened these doors. So this is why we're dealing with these things, because some of you can see some of the same things in your family. You see some of the same problems. And in your private life, you struggle with them. You struggle with certain attitudes, certain dispositions, certain behaviors, certain things are easy for you to fall back into. Certain things, certain mindsets, because what is known as, it's known as an iniquitous pattern or a family iniquity. And it was passed down to many through the bloodline. Because, whether you, whether you know it or not, spirits cannot be seen, but they transfer. Spirits, wicked spirits, demonic spirits are, again, unseen but they are very much real, and they can influence you and I. They can't possess you as a child of God, but they can certainly influence you. They can certainly influence you by a way you think, by an iniquitous pattern, by a behavior, again, by an emotional mindset, by a, something that you just have by way of a symbol, something that you do. These are things that the enemy looks for as doorways to continue you in a pattern of behavior, a pattern of thinking, a pattern of feeling, a pattern of acting, even though you are a child of God. Y'all see what I'm saying? Some of you struggle with things. Pornography. Witchcraft. Some of you, all family members, was in all kind of black magic, white magic. Dibbling, dabbling in Ouija boards and tarot cards and palm reading and horoscopes and all this stuff and good luck charms and rabbit's foots and horseshoes over your doorway. I've been to people's houses, they got horseshoes over their, their doorway. Good luck. They don't even know. These are, these are symbols, but they're symbols of darkness. And whether you know it or not, they are attracting spirits. They're attracting the spirits that's associated with these things. You, you, you got to be careful what you bring into your house by way of magazines and literature and, and, and symbols and things that you don't know about. Because whether you know it or not, what, you could be ignorant of it. But the spirit says, I'm not ignorant. I know exactly what this is for. And I'm going to come in your family. I'm going to come in your life. And I'm going to start influencing you because in your ignorance, you are worshiping idols. You are, you, are, you are invoking things. And so these are things that you have to be mindful of, and this is why God gives you and I, as his people, eyes to see. If you will stop and start looking and seeing the enemy for who he is, and you begin to now 
do what the word of God says. And so this is why we began talking about these things, because they're very much real. And I want to read you this last scripture before we get into the the solutions. I'm closing out. Look what it says here. Proverbs 26, 2 says this. As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. A curse cannot come to your family unless it has a reason. There has to be an open door. The same way a police officer cannot arrest you without probable cause. Can't come in your house without probable cause or a search warrant. Got to have probable cause. He got to smell some weed. He's got to hear somebody screaming. He's got to see some blood. He's got, he's got to be a reason. He just can't, a police officer just can't come in your door and make an entry into your house unless he or she has probable cause or you've done something that is against the law and they have the, uh, they have the authority of an arrest warrant or a search warrant to now come into your house. It's the same way with a curse. A curse cannot come to your family, come to your life, unless it has a reason. There must be a reason. You have done something or you're doing something that allows this curse or this pattern to continue, even though you're a child of God. And that's why the devil wants you to be ignorant. He wants you to be ignorant. He don't want you to see. He wants you to continue doing the same thing. He wants you to come to church. He wants you to dress up. He wants you to come and hear the word of God. Clap your hands, stomp your feet, shout and dance, and go right back home and start doing the exact same things you've always done. He wants you to continue lying. He wants you to continue slipping and dipping. He wants you to continue drinking. He wants you to continue smoking. He wants you to continue doing your little, you know, tap. uh, What's my sign today? What is what is what is what is what is say about my sign? Uh, He wants you to continue doing all that kind of stuff because now. He has a doorway to keep coming in your life. He wants you to continue disobeying God's word. God's word says, come, you don't come. God's word says, give, you don't give. God's word says, bless, you don't bless. God's word says, forgive, you don't want to forgive. You want to continue in the anger. You want to continue in the resentment, in the bitterness. You want to hold on to it because it empowers you, makes you feel good to be mad. Makes you feel good to be angry. Makes you feel good to hold that against them. That's the only thing you got to go off of is your anger and your bitterness. But you don't know. It's binding you to an iniquitous pattern. So the devil says, now I can keep binding you. I can keep you from what God wants to bring in your life. I can keep these things in your life and keep you limited and held to a function and a way of living that is way below God's best for your life. And then I can ultimately get you to deny God altogether and lift up your eyes in hell. Because some people believe, they believe certain lies. You, you believe that he can get you to believe because remember the devil can speak in the first person. He can sound like you. It's just the way I am. Man, that's the way God gave me. I mean, I was born like this. You were not born in any kind of way other than how God created you. I mean, I, I, I've talked, I've talked, I mean, I've talked to homosexuals, I've talked to lesbians, I've talked to them, and, and they like, I've I've been like this since since I can remember. Well, you don't remember everything, first of all. And you also don't recognize that the spirit of perversion has been in your family for many, many years, long before you was born. And so this same perversion that had your mama, your daddy, your granddaddy, whoever else, is the same perversion that's now in you. And the same spirit of deception is now lying to you and telling you this is who you are. And the same bondage is is holding you to it and makes you think this is who you are. But that's not the truth. That's not the reality. The word of God is the truth. And what God says about you is true. And what God says is right. That's what's right. But the laws and society and all that is tells you, well, it's okay. But you don't know. It's the doorway for the enemy to keep on binding you and keep you held in bondage against your will to a pattern of behavior that is contrary to the will of God. I just got to have a sip. You know, I just got to have a little bit of wine, a little bit of, got to have a little nightcap. I got to have a little bit of something with my, when, before, to just to ease my day from a, from a long, hard day of work. And you don't know that nightcap becomes two. Two becomes three. Three becomes six. Before you know it, it's, it becomes not one day, it's every day. It's every other day. Then it's every day. And before you know, you, 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 you're a full-blown alcoholic. But you're able to function. You know, I know guys who, I know guys and women who are, who are weekend drug addicts. They binge on the weekends. 
but then they can go to work during the rest of the week. Some, they can't do it. They, 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 some of them are just flowing. They can't. They, it's taking control of their whole life. But that's what the enemy is waiting to do. He's trying to take over your whole life, little by little. So that's what I'm saying. We have to recognize these things, and we got to fight them. And we got to break them. I like this, what it says, because this is why. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm going to give you these things, and I got to close out. Man, y'all quit, quit asking these questions. I hear you asking them. Look, Joshua 11. Look, read this. I mean, read it, read it for yourself. Joshua 11, 21 and 22 says this. And at the time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims from the mountains, from Hebron, from Debir, and from Anab, and from all the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. There was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only, look at what it says here, only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod did they remain. That's Joshua 11. Now, this is when the Israelites were making their conquest. God had given them the land of Canaan. They had, they had went in through, under Joshua, and, and, and they had destroyed all the enemies and took over the land. And in this particular instant, Joshua had driven out all these giants. But guess what? They left a few alive in Gath, in Gaza, and in Ashdod. Now, several hundred years later, Look what the Bible says here. 1 Samuel 17. Y'all know the story. I don't have time to read it all. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Succo at, that belonged to Judah and pitched between Succo and Azekah in, it said, in the um, it's fast dim, and Saul and his men were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Eli and set the battle in array against the Philistines and the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And look what it says here, verse 4. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. Look where he's from, Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he, had a, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear weighed about 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle array? Am I not a Philistine and ye servants of Saul? Choose you a man. And let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and kill me, then he, uh, then he said, we'll be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of, of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And look what the Bible says in verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Several hundred years earlier, when Joshua and his men had the ability, had the grace of God, had the power to destroy all the enemies, they left some of them alive in Gath. Y'all read it. They left them in Gath, Gaza, and Ashdod. Several hundred years later, because they left that enemy alive, because they didn't deal with that enemy, here is one of the descendants of these giants that's in their land, just like the enemy can be in your family, in your life, as a child of God, standing up before you saying, I defy what the Word of God says. I dare you to try to live for God. I got you bound. Because I'm the God of alcohol, and I got you. I'm the God of drugs, I got you. I'm the God of fear, I got you. I'm the God of witchcraft, I got you. I'm the God of manipulation, I got you. I'm the God of anger, I got you. I'm the God of perversion, I got you. I'm the God of bondage, I got you. I dare you to come out here and fight me. Send me somebody that's able to defeat me. Because they were unwilling to deal with the family iniquity. Here it is. Now, a giant, and every one of them is sitting just like this. Everybody paralyzed. Everybody afraid. Won't nobody move and fight, just like some of us. 
You come to church, you look strong. You come to church, you're jumping, you're shouting, you're hollering, you're hooping, you're doing a lot of good stuff. But in private, you're defeated. In private, you're sinning. In private, you're bound. In, in private, you're depressed. In private, you, got, you, 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 can't, you can't get past that pornography. You can't get past, again, that lust. You can't get past that alcohol. You can't get past that abuse. You can't get past that sexual molestation. You can't get past the perversion of your flesh. You just can't get past that. You, you, you want to come and serve God, but it's just something that's always plaguing you, and you don't want anybody to know about it. You're living in silent frustration because the enemy is saying in your soul, come on, fight me. Come on. Who's going to come in? Who's going to deal with me? Is it going to be you? Is it going to be you? Who's going to deal with this issue? Who's going to deal with this? Who is going to fight me? Who's going to defeat me? I've been in your family for hundreds of years. I've been, in your, I've been here for hundreds of years. Y'all didn't deal with me hundreds of years ago in my family. That's what the Spirit is saying. And I'm still here today. So now you got to deal with me. And since you don't want to deal with me, I'm going to get your sons. I'm going to get your daughters. I'm going to get your grandsons. I'm going to get your granddaughters. I'm going to get all of them because you will not fight. You will not break this family iniquitous pattern. Do you see what we're saying? Do you see why God told us at the beginning of this year, is there not a cause? Is there not a reason for you to now stand up and fight and not be so casual, not be so careless, not be so flippant, not be so uh, uh, compromising in your relationship with God? You're more interested in Facebook and football and basketball and sports and, and what you drive and what you wear and what you look and, and all these kind of things. And you're not even paying attention to, that there's an enemy trying to take your family away. That there is an enemy trying to destroy you, and you want to come to church and be religious? You want to come to church and play church, and you don't understand the spiritual and soul, I mean the soul significance of what God wants to do, and you are going to allow an enemy to hold you in bondage? And this is why God raised up a David with an anointing that says, I'll fight that giant. Yeah, I'll fight him. David says, not only will I fight him, I'm going to take his head off. David says, I'm going to break this pattern today. This one right here is going to be broken today. And that has to be your same mindset. As anointed children of God, you got to look and see what the enemy's been doing in your life for years, your family for years. And you're going to have to say, Lord, you've anointed me. Lord, You've called me for such a time as this. Lord, I am going to break this. This is not going to go any further than me. I am going to break this pattern. I said that to God when he began to show me this years ago. I said, you know what? I said, Lord, I want to be a man of God. I told you the testimony. We was living on Bradley Street. We was living on Bradley Street at the time. And I remember I was, I was, I was so frustrated in my walk with God. I was frustrated. Because I was being pulled, you know, pulled to want to go back and pulled to to want to go back and do something. Man, I was I was single. I wanted to. I mean, I just wanted to. Just man, I said I want some booty. I mean, I, I'm just being honest. I said, God, I want some. I was like, man, I was frustrated, and I was like, man, living for you is so hard. I was like, God, this is hard, you know, because I didn't have. I mean, I couldn't get to church. I didn't have nobody. I didn't have saints to fellowship with. I didn't have people to talk to. I was there in Burlington all by myself. Everybody in my family crazy, unsaved, drinking, getting high. I mean, it was crazy. And I was only about 19 years old. I was 19 years old, man. I was frustrated. I never forget. I came out on that porch, man. I came out on the porch, and I was so frustrated. And and I remember I looked out at that car. I looked out of my car. I had a little rabbit. I had a little, little Volkswagen rabbit. It had some little chrome wheels on it. It had a banging system. On the license plate, it had I'm Stone. It was on my like I'm Stone. And I never forget. I looked at that license plate. I, I was frustrated too. I said, I, and I looked out there. I said, God, because I said, Lord, I've tasted of your goodness. I said, God, you saved me. You delivered me. You, you showed me who you are. And, I, and I've experienced your goodness. But I was saying, God, this is so hard. I mean, I'm like, God, this is hard. I was like, man. And I just, I, I, was, I was under temptation. The devil was taking them fiery dry. He was just shooting them. Woof, woof. Yeah, just go on back. Go ahead, and just go ahead, man. God understands. Go ahead, go on, go on get you a little something and come on back. God, you ask God for forgiveness. I was like, I'm saying, yeah. That's what I'm saying, yeah. 
Maybe I can do that. Maybe I can just, maybe I got saved too soon. Maybe I should have waited a little bit longer. Maybe I should, I should experience a little bit more in the world. I was only 18. Why did I get saved so soon? I got time to go out here and experience life a little bit and then come back to God. Maybe I'm, just too, maybe I'm too radical. Maybe, I, maybe I, I, I just got too radical too fast. My friends already told me, Stone, you crazy anyway. They were like, you, oh, you crazy. Stone and went crazy. I'm like, and I was like, ah. And I was there, and that warfare was going on. And I never forget the Holy Spirit came on me. That's so how you got to have the power of the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost came on me. Not in no tangible way. I just heard the Holy Spirit say, but I saved you. He said, you belong to me. And I never forget, I said, yes, Lord. I get emotional thinking about it. I said, yes, Lord. I said, Lord, I belong to you. I looked at that license plate. And I went into warfare. I didn't even know it was warfare, but I, I made a decision. I made a declaration to God. I said, Lord, I want to be a man of God. I said, I don't want to go back. I don't want to bring dishonor to your name. I said, Lord, do a work in my heart. I said, change my life. That day, I said, I don't want to be I'm stone anymore. I said, I'm going to be a man of God. I said, I'm going to be a man of God. I made that decision, standing on the porch, 19 years old at 711 Bradley Street. I walked over to that car. I got in it. I drove to the DMV. I parked that car. I got out, took the license plate off, and I went in, and I said, give me a regular license plate. I said, I don't even want to be identified with the person I used to be anymore. I said, I want the license plate changed. I went back home. I went back home. I began to look at the areas of my life. I began, I had a whole plethora of, of tapes that I used to, I mean, all kind of music I used to listen to, rap and all kind of stuff, had all kind of spirits on it. I took all of my box them up. I got rid of them. I went through my wardrobe. I started looking at my clothes. I started looking at the clothes I was wearing. I used to party. I used to sleep around. I used to do all that. I used to do all of them clothes. I, I, I took all of them. I got back to school. I threw them down the trash chute. I had one pair of black pants. I had one white shirt. I had one tie. I said, I'm going to dress like a man of God. I will not wear these clothes of seeing the church anymore. I said, I'm going to dress like a man of God. I began to set my eyes on men of God who was walking in integrity, who was loving their wives, who was praying, who were faithful, who was doing the will of God. And I began to mark them. I began to mark them. And I began to watch them. I began to say, Lord, that's going to be me. I began to get into this Bible. I began to study. And God began to show me, do you see these things in your life? And for the first time, my eyes were open again. And I began to see these patterns. And I began to see these iniquities. And I began to say, God, I got to break these things. Because if I don't break these things, there's no hope for my family. <laughs> like David. David was the youngest of eight children. I said, I'm the youngest of eight children in my family. I said, Lord, you saved me. I said, I am the first in my family to be born again and honor God in a real way. I said, I got to go back to UNCG where there's 13 women to one. I said, Lord, keep me. And he kept me. Because I began to say, we're going to break these iniquities. I will not be a fornicator. I will not drink alcohol. I will not succumb to drugs. I will not 
compromise that they, I will not steal and lie and be angry and stay bitter because I was an angry soul. I was angry and I would hold resentment and unforgiveness. And, I, and that day God freed me and the joy of the Lord flooded my soul. And I began to be able to love and release and really honor. And, and, and God again began to break these things. And I began by the grace of God to go and close doors. Tear down these different, I began to get rid of again images and, and pictures and places and change associations because God said if you don't close these doors the enemy will always have access to your life and from that time I began to see my spiritual life just begin to go up and up and up because God began to give us strength to fight and I've been fighting now for 30 years for 30 years fighting and destroying and then God gave me a wife, and we began to fight together. And we began to come in agreement to destroy iniquity because we said we got children. There's a whole generation coming behind us that we have to be an example to, that we have to be, again, an instrument of righteousness for God's grace to now come through this family and change the stone name from that which was perverted and corrupt and twisted to now something that is righteous, to that which is a good name, to that which, again, speaks of the character of Christ. And you got to do the same thing, saints of God. And you can't be casual. You can't be, you just can't be one who just plays religion and accepts what the enemy gives you because that is not God's will for your life. Come on, let's stand to our feet. I didn't even get to any of the points. I didn't get to any, but I'm out of time. I'm out of time. So if, if you will, come back. We, we may be able to get to, to some of how to break these things, how to break them, because there are principles. There are principles that, you can, that God wants to give you, tools and, and weapons that he wants to give you to break these iniquities in your family. And I want to share them with you. I'm just out of time today. But if you will come back, Lord willing, we'll, if the Lord says the same, we'll get to them next week. But I hope you receive the impartation of what the Spirit of God is saying today. You receive the impartation. Come on, lift your hands in the presence of the Lord. I just want to pray for you. I want to pray for you before we get our children and bring them up. Because, brothers and sisters, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And if you will hear me now, just, just, close, your, just close your eyes and lift your hands in the presence of the Lord. Because what I'm doing now by the authority in Jesus' name, I'm speaking to demonic forces that's been trying to whisper and lie to you and hold you in bondage and hold you in captivity and have you again bound to behaviors and actions and beliefs and mindsets that are contrary to the will of God. It's not the will of God for you to be bound in any area. Perversion, I don't care what happened to you. I don't care who did it. That's not who you are. Hear what I'm saying by the Spirit of God. You are who God says you are. You are who God says you are. He created you in his image. He created you in his likeness. Women of God, you are beautiful no matter what a man said to you or what he did to you. Man of God, you are strong and you are valiant. You are a man of God. You are not emasculated. You are not to be infeminate. You are not to be homosexual. You are not to be perverted and twisted, having children out of wedlock and engaging in all type of perversions. You are to stand as a man and a woman of God and fulfill God's purpose for your life. So I speak to the bondage. I speak to the spirit of perversion. I speak to the, the, the lying, deceiving spirit. I speak to the spirit of whoredom. I speak to the spirit of witchcraft. I speak to sorcery. I speak to, again, the, the spirit that tries to halt and, and hinder and, and bind. I speak and I declare freedom. I declare to every unclean spirit, thoughts that try to, that those unclean thoughts and those ideologies, I speak and I declare be clean, be pure. You receive the spirit of the Lord where you can walk in purity. No more nightmares, no more night terrors, no more yielding to the perversions of the flesh. I, I command the spirit of God to drive out every 
opposing force in your life. You are who God says you are. You can do what God says you can do. You shall see your destiny. You shall fulfill God's purpose for your life. You shall stand and having done all to stand, keep on standing. You keep on fighting. You got to break every curse. You got to break poverty. I speak against poverty. I speak against, again, laziness. I speak against the spirit that tries to get you to quit and give up. I speak to every spirit that is that vagabond spirit that wants you to wander and go from place to place to place. I speak a settling in your heart, a settling in your spirit. I speak the strength of God in your life. I speak to depression. I speak to the spirit of heaviness. I speak to that darkness that tries to keep you in confusion. And I command light to break forth. I command light to break forth. I command for the burden of God to be placed upon you. His burden is easy. What he gives you is light. Receive the joy of the Lord. Receive the joy of the Lord. Receive the peace of God for those of you all who are used to confusion and drama and all types of chaos. I speak peace. Peace to every raging storm. Peace to even family infirmities. You shall not die but live. You will not die. You shall live and fulfill the plan of God for your life. You will not have, again, a, a, a heart attack. You will not have strokes. You will not, again, die from the diseases of your family. You shall live and declare the works of God. Infirmity, go by the authority in Jesus' name. And I command a new way of living, a new way of walking, Receive the grace of God. Father, we thank you today. We thank you today. We thank you. Because by your word, you drove out spirits. And by the authority in your word, we drive out every one of these spirits. And we thank you now for the freedom that's in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the weapons of our warfare that are not carnal, but mighty through you to pull down strongholds. Every imagination, every high and lofty thing that tries to exalt itself against your knowledge. Give us to fight. Give us to war.